Hello, KCIW listeners, and welcome to Curry Cafe, where we put together a panel of volunteers and guests who discuss various topics from whimsical and fun to more serious subjects. Welcome to another edition of the Curry Cafe. We're here with a group of experts that I've gathered just to talk about this particular subject today. As always, I've chosen some of the finest people I could find. My name is Ray Gary, by the way, and today we're going to be talking about affordable housing and what can we do with the homeless people to get them in affordable housing. So we're going to go around the table now and have everybody introduce themselves. Hi there, this is Shirley Hyatt, and to my left is Lee Tooley, a principal broker at Town & Country Real Estate, and I've uh, done some development work and so forth. I've trained as a mediator for tenant-landlord relationships, lots of stuff like that. This is Kathy Justman uh, of the Chetco Activity Center, and um, I live in affordable housing. That makes me an expert on this problem. And I'm Rick McNamer, volunteer at KCIW, and have been both a homeowner, homeowner and a renter. So we'll see what I can contribute. Okay, who'd like to start up? Would you, 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 Lee, I bet you're just chomping at the bit to say something. Um, actually, no, but oh. uh, I'm happy to say well, something. Well, sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so we're, we're talking about uh, affordable housing, and that is something near and dear to my heart because it is so necessary. And this town... There's so many places that don't have enough employees because I can't find any any housing for them. I've actually had restaurant owners ask me to find them a place that they could buy in order that they could rent it to their employees. It's that desperate. And a lot of places aren't open as many days a week as they would like because they can't get the staff for the same reason. I mean, it really, it really influences a lot of things in town that we wouldn't ordinarily think of it. So, go ahead. And I'm at the Chetco Activity Center. I hear a lot about this problem. People who've had a home for their whole lives are sometimes faced with an emergency eviction situation, um, hospitalization, don't know where they're going to live when they get out of the hospital. It's really it's really um, something you hear about when you are working with seniors and people who come for a free meal. Well, you know, uh, Kathy, I live in affordable housing, too. I moved up here from the Bay Area in the year 2000, and my sister and her husband had previously uh, moved from California, and she encouraged me when I retired to consider coming here, which I did, and I was looking for a place that I could afford, and I found affordable housing, and that means that it is subsidized by the government. Now, my particular uh, place is also subsidized by a rural development program that comes out of the agricultural department. But it is subsidized, and a lot of people say, oh, it's low income, and it's not worth having, and they have basically kind of a negative attitude about it. But it's not true. These these are well-built, and they're nicely appointed, and if they're managed properly, they're very nice places to live, and there's a tremendous need for it. There, what uh, Are there five... Five of I think there are down. five yeah. big ones, um, and um, some are sp- smaller ones sponsored by the tribe, possibly, because we don't know where all of the uh, subsidized housing is. But they all have long waiting lists. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, just if you want to get on the list, no, you're not going to get there for three or four years. Mm-hmm. So it, it's, a, it's a real problem. And as, as you were saying, Lee, when people come here, they say, well, where am I going to live? Well, they can't rent a property. If the, if the people who are the corporations or people you're referring to, they want to buy the property so they can rent it, well, that's still a rental progr- uh, problem. So say a little bit more about that, maybe. Well, um, about the part about people... About the corporation then buying... Well, that's happening all over the country. There's a huge number of... Um, corporations, well, a huge amount of the housing um, resource that we have overall is owned by these corporations. And it's kind of a monopolizing kind well, of it effect is. Yeah. because at, when you have over 50% housing owned by these few handful of people or groups, I should say, 
um, they can really control the price and drive it up. I mean, we do have laws about that, which is a good thing, but still, it's a, it's a heavy influence in the market, and it makes property prices higher than they would ordinarily be. And really, owning property is like the last place that the average citizen can make a, a, a nest egg for themselves. Everything else, you know, pensions and all those kind of benefit programs we used to have have gone away. But, you know, the, th the thing that I think about being an, an older person <clears throat> is that you don't realize anything on that property until you sell it. And if you are elderly and you intend to die in that home, let's say, uh, then that gets sold only if the people who inherit it are willing to sell it or whatever. But what I'm saying is, is housing as a nest egg, I think, used to be, well, you buy a starter home, and then when you can afford it, you sell that and you buy a little bit nicer one, and then you sell that and you buy it. So it was sort of like built into the process that you wouldn't just buy a family home and live in it until you died. No, you, you, it became a process of, well, eventually you'll get the house you want. But in the meantime, <laughs> in the meantime, live in a house that you can then fix up a little bit and then well, sell it. Well, that's like so life. It's, it's like, pardon me? That's like life. It's step by step. You yeah. try to improve your way through your life. Yeah, but through real estate, I guess what I'm trying to get at is that, that this is where people's money is tied up in their home. And so they don't realize a profit on that until they sell it. And well, so yes then and where no. do you go? You know? One of the things that is really highly criticized by a lot of people is uh, reverse mortgages. And I'm actually a fan. If you're an older person and you've lived in that house for a million years and you've built up a little bit of equity, you can really improve your budget by doing a reverse because then I agree. you're not paying a mortgage payment. So you've got all that extra cash flow to see you through your golden years, so to speak. The, yeah. the mortgage payment is just the mortgage payment, right? You still have- Pardon me? You, that's just the mortgage payment. You still have uh, taxes and interest. You still and, have taxes, and you've got to keep it insured, and you've got to maintain it, you know, basic things like that, so that the mortgage lender isn't at risk. But um, you can do a lot of things with it. You don't just get rid of your mortgage payment. If you have a lot of equity, you could take a cash lump sum out even. There's yeah. all kinds of ways to structure it. My sister did that, and by the time she was ready to sell the house, she had practically nothing left. <laughs> that happens. But, you know, that, that, is, that is part of the equation. Mm -hmm. But, you know, getting back to the idea of, of renting, um, I think a lot of people are afraid to rent because they think that the property won't be taken proper care of, which is a shame because, you know, I've rented over the years from time to time, and I always figured this is my home, so I would take care of it. You're the but exception. that isn't the mentality of, of a lot of people, unfortunately. Yeah, you're the exception. Ren renters will almost certainly not take care of the place. I don't it's know. not the way you would. Yeah. Yeah. As a rule. So I'd like to ask, Lee, are we in a housing bubble right now? Is um, our real estate artificially inflated? Well, if you think about supply and demand, there's a lot of demand for being here. So many of our buyers come from somewhere else. And it's, you know, global warming and so forth. There's a lot of places that people don't really want to live anymore. Forget the Southwest, the South, um, even Southern California, and then the whole, um, like, uh, the, um, what do you call it, the, the California Valley area from Redding on down, that whole. It's, it's so just hot. way too hot for anybody to live comfortably, especially as you get older and you can't handle the heat the way you used to, you know. So um, there's a lot of demand, and as we go forward in time, that's probably going to just accelerate. And one of the weird things about this county is it is pretty much already built out. We have all this open land, but it's mostly unbuildable. There's less than 2% of available land left to build on here. So yeah, Why is it unbuildable? Too steep, too this, too that, but mostly too steep. We're, we're in a mountainous region, really. I think you're familiar zone. with... <laughs> What's you, in a in a flood zone. Well, there's that too. Yeah, I think you're familiar with where I live. Uh, yeah, vaguely. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, okay. Now, recently, about six hundred acres was sold to somebody, and from what I'm told, he can't build on that for various reasons. One is, uh, 
uh, they can't put in enough roads to handle a subdivision or, or proper roads and water and things like that. Is and that... fire, fire access, like yeah, fire trucks and things like that well, can't get in. Yeah, the um, the land behind um, uh, the, another portion of land, the huge po portion, is owned by the by the uh, uh, lumber company, and I was I walk on that road every morning, and I was surprised one day to see that they had bulldozed the thing across. They closed it, so I I immediately went to the fire department. Said, Can they legally do that? That knocks out the fire access to me, or people from my subdivision have to go out. Through there, they, we're we're there, and we can't get through that. One of the other really limiting factors is water. Um, well, we just had that um, agreement up there at Lone Ranch to provide them with water, and we don't even have enough water to do any more development at all. And we're going to have increasing problems with that as global warming, climate change continues. So there's that too. You know, we depend it's all, on the Chetco, and it's actually a very small river, and it doesn't have any uh, snowpack. It's all interweaving, all of these things that have to be met in order for it to happen. Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, even when people have property that they can build on, they want to make money, so they don't want to necessarily join hands with the government program and maybe have income of a lesser degree, or they don't want to deal with that part of it. But I, I think um, being a person who has relied on being able to rent a nice place, I really think that a lot of people prefer, if they can rent, and, and they're obviously not going to trash the place, <laughs> but if they can rent, there just isn't anybody that's willing to rent property if they can sell it. I mean, is that true? Do you think? They're not willing to rent it if they can sell it. I mean, they, they prefer to sell it rather than to keep it as a, a rental property. I don't know about that. I, I would comment, though, when you're talking about the pressure, um, the, the, the preference to have a rental be more affordable is that because property is so expensive, you're going to end up ha being in a deficit with your mortgage in a lot of cases. So, you know, we have very little stock for the amount of people that want to rent. Um, that is that makes any sense on paper, where a person isn't necessarily making a huge profit, but at least they're not losing money mm -hmm. on it. And so that's, you know, makes it kind of yeah. tough. I have a question. Yeah, Lee. sure. Lee, is the um, government, either at the federal or the state level, trying to incentivize house building, or maybe someone else knows something about this? I, I really don't know much about the government programs. You two who do affordable housing, you probably know more than I do. But I will say that um, one of the things that makes building so difficult is that construction costs have gone through the roof. Here, if you want to build a custom house, let's just say, which is not what we're talking about, but it's what, something I know a little bit about, um, you're going to wait probably a couple of years before your contractor can even start. And then you're going to have extreme high construction costs. And corollary with that is that the guys that know how to do these skills are all retiring and getting too old to work and so on. And there aren't a lot of people replacing them. So if you want a plumber, electrician, a general contractor, it's really hard to get the guys that know what they're doing or even anybody these days. So there's a skill deficit in our housing Absolutely. shortage. And, uh, there are other deficits. Anybody have any other deficits in our housing short? What's making the housing shortage? Well, the cost of materials, I, I did kind of mention that, but the cost of materials has gone through the roof in the last few years, just through the roof. And getting, I, I imagine it's more expensive here than it would be like in Medford. I mean, we're out here, and we're not on the way to any place. I mean, if somebody coming here with a load of lumber is coming here. They're not on their way to San Francisco. Or, yeah, I'm not uh, real uh, sure about that part, but it could be, could be an influence. Well, just as an example, I put a window in my living room that had lost its seal, and it cost me $400 um, less than two years ago. And another one lost its seal recently. Same window, exact match for size and all. And um, it was over 1000 Wow. And that's pretty typical. Things have more than doubled in many cases. I mean, I'm sure there's exceptions. 
I'm a I'm a renter like Shirley and and Kathy in a unique situation, and I uh, I was a homeowner until my wife sadly passed away five and a half years ago. And now, granted, we should have set things up differently, but we just didn't. You know, there's a lot of seniors. I don't know what the percentage is, but I'm sure there are a lot of lot of seniors in the same predicament. But I was lucky to have an old friend up here who I've been renting from for five and a half, well, a little over five years now. And at times, when it looked like she might have been either wanting to sell, now she kept me abreast of all this. But when I was scrambling around looking to find a place, it's, I'm down in Smith River, but general area from Crescent City to Brookings, there's hardly anything out there. Oh, I know. To rent, number one. Yeah. And um, uh, of course, they, and they want a lot of people that want to rent. It's exorbitant fees just to get in. Oh, and so, as, as a young person, how do you even get into the housing market to buy something when a kind of okay, kind of rundown mobile home on a tiny little postage stamp piece of land is over 300000 now? Now, who's going to be able to do that as a young person starting out in life when you were talking about going up the ladder and reinvesting as you go? But how do you get your start? I just finished a darling little um, park model that's a small home, like a one-bedroom home, uh, right by the beach, and it's on the market for seventy nine five, And that's, you know, it's a lot. It's not pocket change, but compared to $300,000, um, it's, it's a possibility. And you can even finance those now. And, and what I'm trying to get to is that I think the marketplace is starting to recognize that there's a real market there for finding solutions. Like we could never, ever have financed something like that a few years back, and now we have people that will lend on it. So that means that you could do that. You could buy, get into something like that for $4,000 down, and most people could scrape that up. So we're looking at a lot of things like tiny homes and so forth now. And for I instance, think those are such a great idea. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, oh, yeah. I'm really hoping that that kind of thing gains some popularity and people don't see it as something awful, but something really quite wonderful. Plus, you just brought up something that, that I've thought about, you know, that the people who need to have a six-bedroom, five-car garage kind of property, I mean, why? Because they can. Um, yeah. But... <laughs> And that's fine. That's the way the world works, you know. But for for really common down to earth kind of living, where you're living well but not extravagantly, it seems like we just need a total different mindset, you know. If everything is about making as much money as you possibly can without considering all of these other things, then then there's always going to be that great divide of the haves and the have-nots. And I want to bring up one more thing and get everybody's opinion on this. Years ago, a friend of mine uh, was involved with a company that was building walls, basically, but then they were branching out to trying to build homes, too, but using um, styrofoam blocks and pouring concrete in the center with the... the oh, yeah. Re re well, this is, this is going beyond needing to have a redwood paneled home. You know what I'm saying? It's mm -hmm. like using other materials that don't re rely on um, the forest. Like you know, hay, to provide hay bale houses and all kinds of things like that. Are but will possible. the banks, will the lenders lend to you if you're not a traditional stick stick built or a classic? Do you see what not I'm so saying? Much, it's like no. it's, But these things are starting to change a little bit. Like with this unit I was just talking about, it's only been on the market a couple of months, and I've had over 100 inquiries. Now, that's a market that is not being served if you get that many inquiries about a property like that. So we've got um, people who want, maybe their parent has been widowed and they want them closer. That's a perfect solution for them. A young person who's just starting out, like we talked about, that's another solution somebody who's on a limited income in some way or another where, you know, they can afford to be in a park next to the beach and, you know, their nut is going to be like 700 a month or something instead of whatever it is now to rent a place, what, 12, 1400? So that's in a park. So they, they have the 79K to buy the house and then they have a park rent on top of that? They would have a park rent, yeah. So... Yeah. 
you know, sometimes there's a parent or a rich relative that'll buy it for them. You know, that's always yeah. nice if you've got it. Um, but if you finance, then your payment's going to be on top of that park rent. Now, what, what, what? where I'm talking about is at the beach, but you can find them for about 500 a month and maybe depending on how much money you can put down and so on. But if you can't put much down and you finance, you're probably looking at maybe 600 in that. So, And these are just like really rough top of my head figures. So I, I can't stand up for them very well. But if you're talking about 1100 and in a few years... If you're a young person, you know, maybe a decade or so, you could have it paid off. Now your rent goes down even lower, right? So, yeah. So I think in the valley where um, there were big fires in Talent and Phoenix and that valley area between Ashland and uh, um, Medford, <laughs> um, they're using modular housing, building it on government land, I think, and then there won't be a land fee. You'll make um, payments on the house you're living in, The more, and it's a modular home. Now, I live in 450 square feet, roughly, and the little, tiny houses would be like half that, about 200 square feet, right? But a modular home could be about 400 to five or 600 feet, depending on if it's a three-bedroom and you have kids or if it's a one-bedroom for an older couple. So these things... If the government owns the land and then mo makes a program for putting modular housing there and they provide the infrastructure and they provide land, then we would have, we could have a housing boom because, and I'm talking about in places where it's not mountainous like here and, and you know, rivers, floods and ocean and, <laughs> and steep hills. But in, if you've got level land, there could be an, in, not, it'd be more than incentive, you know, it would be providing something as the foundation of building more housing. And I think it's got to go that far because we are like, we are like, whew, uh, 20 uh, million homes short. I don't know if that's the number of housing or the, the number, I mean, the number of homeless or the number of unhoused families. But when you count all the cities, it's like there are millions of people looking for housing. Now, tiny houses, I, I understand there's a tiny house subdivision or a community, so I've never seen it. Could you tell us about that? I can tell you uh, something local. Yes. What's that it's, one right on the On the river. So you know about it. Why don't yeah. you talk about it? Because I don't know about it. There's, there's two of them. If you, well, they've been there for a long time. If you drive up the North Bank, that little community that's just, off to the right, what am I trying to say? <laughs> I think River those resort. are, I think those are, yeah, if you're talking about there, that's, those are park models. Park, park model. models are park bigger. Model. Yeah. They usually generally run in the 400 square foot range, four to 500 square feet. But it used to be you couldn't, um, what am I trying to say here? Uh, you couldn't get a loan on those. They were. That's casual. what I'm talking about. That's yeah. what you can do now is you can get a loan yeah. on them, right. which is great. I mean, it's amazing. And, um, you know, that's, Different from a tiny home that tend to be really compact, like the inside of a small RV. You know, everything right. does double duty. And I mean, these are actually pretty comfortable homes. I can live in 400 square feet, no problem. I, I lived uh, every winter for, for many years in a, in a motor home that, uh, let's see, what it was eight by 31. So whatever that comes to as far as square footage. And it was recently. 240. Before. 240. That's pretty small. Yeah. Right. I, uh, <laughs> The only problem with it was it drove me crazy. If I if I wanted to get my computer out, I had to go to where it was and put it on the table and move everything. And, uh, it was a real hassle. Yeah. I, I couldn't find, do that much longer. But I find 400 or so is a lot more comfortable. You don't have to do that much mm -hmm. manipulating of your things. <laughs> so I, I was under the impression there's, there's a tiny house community that has more or less just been completed. Do you don't know about that? I don't know. That people were going and looking at models, and it's yeah. somewhere on the river. Oh, oh. Hmm. I don't, there's my understanding. You it's, sure it's, it's tiny homes built. and not park models? Right. But, but, now, maybe people were just describing to me as tiny homes when, in fact, they were park models. I really don't know. And well, now, you know. Um, the problem with if park models, if they're built like most, Mobile homes are they? They're probably pretty trashy, and they're going to start to 
wear out and run down very quickly. If you maintain them, they can be kept up forever. Yeah. It's that a lot of people, how can I say this, that don't maybe have the habit of maintaining a place. Right. And then they let it go. And yeah, they'll fall apart on you. They sure will. But normal, easy, reasonable maintenance will keep them going for a long time. I had one that was um, a relative of mine had it um, over at Rainbow Rock. And it was a single wide from 1973. And it was like it was brand new. You know, and I know a couple others like that. It's just a matter of how much you keep them. I remembered what I was going to say earlier. It was, uh, uh, I've recently been delivering Meals on Wheels, and um, about half the houses that we deliver to are really, really substandard housing. Uh, In Sacramento, you could have, like, gotten free rent from your landlord for having a house like that. Uh, And... um, but these are mainly um, probably they own it and it's they're paying land rent. You know, these are in like uh, parks, but they're old, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s trailers or modular homes from that era. So like they leak, they're moldy, they're, the windows leak, you know, and they're, they're drafty. People who live in something like that don't have the money to keep them. The up. kitchen doesn't work. That's right. They have... They have Social Security and nothing else, and they can't fix it up. So this is like some of the housing that we have in our county and in, our, in the South County here, really close by, I'm saying, really, really poor living conditions. I, I oh. bought a manufactured home in Tucson, which is a strange place when it comes to real estate. Uh, we were looking for a, a, a winter home for my sister-in-law, basically, and didn't want to spend a lot of money for it, so we were running down all the... Uh, you know, all the 75, 80, uh, under $100. And it, it turned out our, our, our way of searching was we, we would find these in the paper or however, and then we would look them up on Google Maps and get an overall view of them. And if, uh, if the place next door wasn't a Hell's Angels compound, then we would go look at it. But it, I, everything in these places we were looking at, bars on the windows. And, but eventually we did find a place that had been... Uh, Owned by an elderly woman, and it was, it was run down just because she didn't have the money to keep it up for one thing, and it was a cheap one to begin with. The the uh, yeah, the kitchen cabinets were actually made out of some kind of a fibrous material that I mm-hmm. I called cardboard, and uh, and and being a a woodworker, that's the first thing I had to change. I made car- cabinets at home and brought them here, but this poor woman had had. Things that needed to be done in the house that she could have fixed for a hundred dollars, but she didn't have a hundred dollars, uh, evidently, or a hundred dollars to spend on the house. It used to be that um, Habitat for Humanity had a program right. to fix things up. I, I don't think know they if it's still here. going. We did have it. I know. I just haven't heard anything about it lately. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Yeah. And they would come in and they would, you know, re-insulate and seal things up and help you manage all those kind of things if you were low income. You're going to say, well, yeah, I, I had a question about the uh, across. I live in Smith River, right, up, pretty close to the ocean, and across the way, all kinds of homes, but they're all, as far as I know, all vacation rental homes. Mm-hmm. Don't those have a big impact? About and I, I've always kind of felt maybe I, I, there were like too many of those around here to impact people that want to stay here. Well, and now this is the big debate that's going on around the B&B thing, too. Yeah. So many vacation homes are being rented out, B&B, vacation, I forget all the initials, but anyway. VRB. VRB, yeah. And um, anyway, it takes a big chunk out of the uh, housing inventory. On the other hand, you know, it brings people in. There's an economic benefit to it. I Personally, um, it's nice that we have that option to, to bring in that economy, but, you know, it's it does make a real bite in the, in the inventory that we have available for people. Isn't it likely that park model you're trying to sell is going to turn into a rental property? No, it can't be rented. Oh. Nothing in a park can be rented or be in beach. Short-term or long-term renting is not oh. allowed. If the one exception is Whale's Head. I don't know how they did that, but they're... They're allowed to do that. They have a central property manager there at Wellshead, 
and they can rent their places out. But everywhere else, forget about it. Uh, the problem with these parks, or well, one of the problems is they're owned by individuals or corporations and they sell them. I know somebody who, who li has lived in one for about six years and her rent has gone up several hundred dollars in the time she's been there. The, and the services have gone down. Her rent used to include things like, I think she said, electricity and things like that. And now it's just garbage collection. So her cost of living is, has gone up significantly. There's not anything she can do about it. There is. And, and I've also okay. heard now, uh, just heard this the other day, that, that one of the mobile home parks that's down on Seaview is closing. I don't know. Mm. Oh, okay. Well, don't don't you think, uh, I hate to sound like too much of a liberal here, but don't, <laughs> don't, you, think, don't you think that basically the overall look at why there are a lot of wealthy people and why there are so many people who will never attain any kind of standard close to that, um, it, it's like the, the balance is so out of whack at this point. And yeah, it is. I, I remember when I lived in Palo Alto, of course, which was just absolutely a lovely place to live, I must say, but a house that we bought for $29,000 was a beautiful little home with a couple of bedrooms and fireplace and wood floors, et cetera, et cetera. You know, that house sold for $3 million um, a few years ago. Now, that's a huge jump. And I'm going to blame the Silicon Valley and the high, high, uh, highly paid people in that industry for that kind of a jump. But it seems like it's not just the Bay Area. It's, a, it's, it's sort of taken over that there are a lot of people who have earned a tremendous amount of money, but... Nobody else is really catching up to them. And uh, so the standard is so wide open. And I don't know how we're going to change that because, you know, it seems like I, I have nothing against money. Don't get me wrong. It's just that the, the greed factor to me has, has stepped in. And then these other altruistic things that we're talking about, they're really not altruistic. They should be basic. It should be basic that you have a decent place to live. It should definitely be a basic. Um, so it's a it's a responsibility of local and and state and federal governments to make sure there's enough housing. But um, I was thinking that um, the if we compared the statistics of how many more jobs there are, say in the Bay Area and Sacramento. That has the housing has increased nearly as much as the number of working people has increased. There's a huge deficit in housing because nobody is trying to make the statistics go together. You know, you can't have um, you know twice as many workers and only fifty percent more housing and expect people to have houses and places to live. Somebody should be measuring these statistics. What What would it cost for somebody? Somebody's moving into town, a retired couple with their dog, and they want to rent a uh, um, an apartment. What, what would they, they be looking at playing? If you've got a, a dog, probably. Yeah, that's why I mentioned. <laughs> or a small that's dog. Might and there okay. might not be an apartment even available. Really? Well, it is crazy trying to find a place to rent these days. I can't tell you the cost because I'm, I'm not renting, but um, I know there's a lot of people searching and very few finding. It's, it's tough. I know people that have jobs in this town that are living in their cars. Yeah, which kind of segues us a little bit into the uh, into the the homeless people. I, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure people drive by and they say, "Well, why don't they get a job?" But having a job in this community doesn't mean you're going to have a place to live. True. But what what can we do to change that balance? I mean, we can all sit here and complain and lay it all out. That's the way it is. But is there any any move afoot? where we can help to change this kind of situation. It might be a matter of changing minds and hearts of people, but it's also, it all comes back to how financially feasible things are to do and how much importance people put on those things. So, I don't know, like, here we've got, the world is covered with water, almost, and we need to desalinate the oceans. But people say, oh, we can't do that, it's too expensive. Well, in the end... Where is your priority? Is it too expensive? Then if it is, then we'll never never do it. But are you following my lead here? I mean, there are ways to conquer some of these issues, but 
somebody has to be willing to do that. And it's only those people who have a lot of money and good intentions and the ability to make it happen. And the rest of us just sit around and complain, you know. So in, in Saudi Arabia it's, and Australia, it's worthwhile in some places to make drinking water from ocean water. It takes a lot of energy, but it's worthwhile because that's the only drinking water they're going to have, especially if what's in the rivers is going to go to the crops. So all over the world now, uh, some people have to pay as much for a bottle of water as for a bottle of fuel. So that is where we are with water. And the uh, Tucson area in, in Arizona is, from what I understand, are already overbuilt as far as their uh, amount of water they have, and they're continuing to build. New subdivisions are going up here and there, and it's And kind that's of kind of what we've got going on here, too. You know, we just don't have the water to do much else. Um, and then the other thing we have to realize that we're working against is that it's beautiful here. We want to live here because it's gorgeous, and you can have a nice country lifestyle and still get most of the services you need. And that's not true in a lot of places. So a lot of retirees, whether it's the hot weather or whatever, they fall in love with being here. Five rivers within a 30-minute drive if you're a fisherman. It's like heaven, you know. It's just so um, hard to balance that out when you've got so many people wanting to be here, retirees that have a little bit of money, they maybe had an expensive house like a you know bungalow in L.A., and they can come up here and buy an oceanfront. So oceanfront has basically doubled in the last few years. What about um, the Winchuck River area and going up into the hills from there? Is that that's all part of of Curry County, right? Oh yeah, yeah. And they have their own fire station. Is there a, a water usage? Problem well, in there. surely the infrastructure isn't there. You have to provide your own in, your own like septic tank. Oh, uh, well, you know, if you go that that far beyond the houses that are already up there, you would have to provide your own infrastructure, just like you would in Lone Ranch, right? Uh, well, Lone Ranch is going to be a development, so it'll probably be developed by the owners that are doing the developing. But we've got lots of areas that are outside of the city limits that are, you know, you've got to do your septic, you've got to do your well. And there's a lot of property that looks like it's buildable, but you can't get water. If you drill a well, you're not going to get anything. And that's very common. In fact, another factor that's staring us in the face about as far as water is concerned, I can't tell you how many properties around here, but it's a high percentage that are getting their water out of some creek or another. They're, they're just throwing a pump into the creek. I see a lot of nodding going on. Yeah. Um, I don't exactly have that, but I do have water from a spring. Yeah. And a lot of those are um, not legal. They just threw a pump into the, the nearby creek, and that's how mine, they get mine the water. Is legal and certified well, and well-maintained. We wouldn't <laughs> want to tell on you on the air. But anyway, um, and one of these days, somebody's going to start uh, clamping down on that kind of thing, and then we're going to have some real problems because there'll be a lot of properties that'll be condemned because they don't have a source of water. Well, they should condemn substandard housing before they start condemning people for getting their water from a not legitimate source, because you should be grandfathered in if you built that place 40 years ago. But if you live in a trailer that's 40 years old and, you know, the kitchen doesn't work anymore, that's where you should start fixing problems. Well, for sure, but um, in terms of this problem with the illegal water sources, you know, it's only going to come to the surface when that area gets more built up, right? And nobody's going to do anything about it until then, and then the person that loses out is going to be the person that doesn't have it in writing on their deed. Did you say the Lone Ranch project is going ahead, the one that's been on I've the books? I've heard for that. I'm not up to date on that okay. particular property. Yeah, I've heard that they're planning to move ahead now. And that, that was supposed to be so-called affordable housing, am, am I correct? I think there's a percentage of it that has to be affordable. That's my... What so I, I wonder what that really means, what that's It's a small percentage. It's yeah. not, yeah. you know, most of it's going to yeah. be McMansions on the Hill. Yeah. And that could be a problem, too, I think. Well, especially because we're giving them our water. 
Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, you don't, it's kind of a harder, you don't want to restrict anybody, I guess, but maybe we do, because where I live on Ocean View Drive in Smith River, my landlord, who's been there 40-some years, said all of those houses weren't there not too long ago. Oh, yeah. And there's a lot of them up there. Uh, but, and Lee, you touched on something earlier I had, it, it, this area being so different, because I came from the Sacramento area, mm -hmm. and man, it's apples and oranges down there. It was just, it's still going on, I think, that we talk about affordable housing and we need to build, but all Sacramento has done that I remember is just leapfrog at suburban asphalt after another and more McDonald's and Walmarts. Yeah. That's what I see. Yeah. I didn't like that. Um, but then again, we need the homes, apparently. So, But up here, do we? I, I hope we don't want to be you know, scraping down trees off of the hills and putting in developments. What do you do? There's real limits on that, though, because of the amount of unbuildable space. So we're not going to see that happen anytime soon. But you've been through Lincoln City lately, like in the last 10 years. You cannot drive down the main street of town. It's 101, and it's laid out just like this, where it's all strung out along the highway. And um, because of that, there's only one way to get from one end of town to the other, pretty much, practically speaking. And it's impossible. You cannot drive in that town. What town did you say? Lincoln City, just up north. Oh. Yeah. I wanted to say one other quick thing um, about your friend that is getting priced out of her mobile. There are restrictive laws about how much you can increase the rent each year, and it's tied to the cost of living, something like that. So once ah, a year. But that is why um, some of those parks close. When the landlord gets tired of those restrictions, they just evict everybody and and then sell it for something else, that, that like a shopping the center. The, the, the park what? Numbers. That may be the case of the park I'm talking about. You probably know what the park is. Uh, all the trailers are, are, are kind of in a circle, and then the middle of it is just a grassy field, and I've been told that that's like a, a super fun site or something. Does that ring a bell with you? Uh, gosh, the only one I know that's in a circle, it's a lot of older single-wides, and it's um, down in Harbor off of Ocean View. And um, it's um, got a grassy circle in the middle because mm -hmm. you can't do much with it because that's a septic field. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, but anyway, I haven't heard anything about it being condemned. There's houses for sale there. Oh, uh, well, some, have... somebody mentioned that at a happy hour the other day that somebody had to move out of there. But that doesn't mean it's uh, true. So I've been visiting the mobile home parks uh, years ago because I was looking for a place to rent, but <laughs> currently it's because of Meals on Wheels delivering. And uh, so, yeah, some of those um, places are um, it, probably in danger of, of closing. One of them is expanding up the hill from where the, the trailers are. I don't want to name any of these yes. places or say the locations of them, but, you know, there's some guy or corporation who's decided they're making money on the land rent, even though the trailers there are really substandard. You know, they're going to open up another road, uh, branch out. <laughs> Other places they want to, you know, evict everybody and, and make a shopping center. There's and that's the way it is, because as Shirley said um, before we started, she said, uh, the almighty God is money, and uh, we don't have enough incentives to keep people in the business of providing affordable housing. So the person who built my affordable housing and Shirley's affordable housing, he's an old man and he just, he built the most recent one 10 years ago. I live in that one. It's the newest affordable housing in town. And I asked him a couple times, uh, are you gonna build more? And the last time I asked him, which was this week, uh, he said, oh, I'm retired. I'm not building anything anymore. <laughs> So if he's gone out of business and nobody else is going to do it, we're not going to get more housing. Well, could you fill us in on, like, I don't know how you could uh, put a number on it, but I, if you do affordable housing as a, as a tenant, what kind of rent do you pay or do you pay any or is it tied to your income? It's or tied, how does it work? It's tied specifically to your income and then any anything that you can deduct, like, legitimate medical expenses, et cetera. But, but there are some rules, and you have to meet those. And I, I brought this, as a matter of fact, to, to talk exactly about okay. what that subsidy looks like. So for um, 
for a, a one-bedroom apartment here. Where are we going here? Um, $347 a month. Oh, my God. That would yeah. be so wonderful. Yeah. 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 And they're nice. But, but if the... you but if you were not if you were not in the subsidy, supposedly the market rent for that would be almost seven hundred. So at the least. Sub- pardon me? At least. I yeah. know people that, you know, rent right. out a room for five hundred a month. So it's Yeah. Ridiculous. So so it's all you know, they can't just keep upping it and upping it and upping it ridiculously mm-hmm. just because they can because there are rules and but it does it does go up and my rent has gone up just incrementally a little bit but everything else goes up too that's true so you know i've never understood why people think that they're making more they're not everything else rises up and mm-hmm. there you are in the same spot and they say well i'll get a raise well then everything else will go up so it's just numbers on a piece of paper at right. some point in time. But if you were to uh, rent, if that person who gets the place for three seventy five, did you say something like that? Um, what kind of income would they have to have to? Qualify well, it's about for that? a third. You pay about a third of your income after all this. So deduction. theoretically, that'd be somebody who's making around fifteen hundred a month or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's good to know. Well, for some reason, I only pay about a fourth of my income as monthly rent. So um, maybe it's because I turn in my dental and, um, you know, have medical costs. Reasons. Yeah. And uh, so I'm pretty diligent about that. Other people might neglect that reporting. But, um, you know, I want to get every discount I can get. Well, for uh, those people who are, are interested, I'll just say that the first property that I saw when I came here is called Azalea Reach, and it's over by the park. And... There are, I think, three four-bedroom apartments in there. Wow. Yeah, which I was surprised, too. And quite a few three-bedroom apartments and two bedrooms. And what they have the least of are one-bedroom apartments. And there are a lot of single people who are sort of out, out of out in the cold, so to speak, because they are all by themselves, but they have the least opportunity Right, and so Pelican's Perch, which is a senior property that is uh, only for qualified people over fifty-five, uh, the rents are higher there. They're not sub- subsidized in the same way, but those again are for one to two people in a, in a one-bedroom apartment. So that's what this kind of subsidized housing looks like. But people don't realize, you know, if you did sign up and you were on the waiting list. There are some four-bedroom apartments. I mean, they're huge. Hmm. I've been in them, and, and it's just amazing. So, you know, it can be done, but people have to be the right kind of... Uh, you have to plan ahead, and if you know that you're low-income, yes, you must plan ahead, because the way you end up homeless is you haven't planned ahead, and your landlord has decided they don't want you anymore, and that's how you end up homeless. By the way, uh, to, I apologize to all the math majors out there. My mouth was a little screwy a minute ago. But anyway, <laughs> speaking of ending up homeless, I mean, I think a vast majority of people that are unhoused are there because we threw all the people who needed help out of the mental institutions. We didn't used to have homeless folks, and this is one of the reasons why. And I get kind of sad because I have friends that are consider themselves progressive and generally are, and they're really negative about the homeless. But where do you want someone who mentally can't get themselves organized enough to keep a job, where do you want them to go? Well, you know, it's, it's funny have... you mentioned that, that uh, uh, a progressive person would be against that because it was the progressives that, that did that thing with the, with the mental health or the mental Mental institutions, yeah. the uh, The idea was, oh, how how can we keep somebody confined, lock them up when they're not going to hurt anybody, and uh, they're not a, they're not endangering they're not themselves a, or somebody not else. A threat to the public. Yes, and uh, so I if you're a little silly, or you walk around that. dressed funny, or you sleep on the ground or whatever. Uh, so yeah, Reagan jumped on the freedom bandwagon. It was like um, there were, I listened to a, an audio book about this subject. There was 
like um, the freedom, the you know, release the birds. Yeah. They shouldn't be locked up if they don't want to be. And Reagan jumped on it as a money-saving idea. That's so it was, was both oh, conservative oh, oh, okay. and a liberal, a liberal part of the mental health uh, services field. And there should have been something for them to move into when that happened, but they ended up on the street. Now, the mental health problem is also a drug problem because mm -hmm. there is housing, say, for veterans, but they have to have no drugs and, and no addictions and not even maybe smoking or drinking. I'm not sure about that part. So, you know, there's a mental health problem. There's an addiction problem, which causes mental health problems. And they overlap. Or maybe the outcome of a mental health problem. Well, and also, don't, don't forget there are those people who are just priced out of their homes because they don't make enough money. And I'm not trying to start an argument here, but, but if you are living in a housing project, for example, that is owned by somebody who raises your rent and says, well, if you can't afford it, I'm sorry, you have to move out, where do they go if they're already paying the maximum for what they can afford? And so some portion of, of the homeless are people who simply can't afford any apartment in the area that they live in. And so they, I, I don't know, it's very complicated and, it, and it's very sad, but so very many people who end up in that lifestyle who say, you know what, screw it, I'm just going to live on the road. I mean, they can, they can take their house and shove it kind of attitude, you know. And yeah. then we have that to deal with, which is, is the person who drop, so-called drops out of society and says, I'm, not gonna, I'm just not going to live the way they need me to live. So it's an attitude that, that's taken over. I mean, how many homeless people are there that fit into the category of the returned vet who's on drugs or who is has a disability, blah, 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 blah? I mean, there are probably layers of people, like you were just saying, Lee, mm -hmm. that some of the people who are actively working still couldn't find any place to live. Right. And, you know, there's something wrong with that equation. Absolutely. And I can imagine that, I can imagine scenarios where somebody has a job, they're not making a lot of money, but they're making some money, and suddenly their lease is up and they have to leave. Oh, God, this reminds me of a place that I was unfortunately part of uh, seeing it sold. Um down there on Hemlock Street, and it was a cute little cottage. He'd lived there forever, and the owner just wanted to make some money. And to your right, I mean, it was worth something, and they'd inherited it and so forth. But we tried and tried and tried and found to find a place for, I think his name was Dwight. This is many years ago now, and uh, I don't even know what happened to him finally. But there was just nothing he could do. He didn't have enough money to get something else. He lived there very cheaply for, you know, decades. Anyway, it's very sad. It, and it's I can imagine terrible, scenarios. It's a very layered problem. Yeah. It really I can is. imagine scenarios where um, people think, oh, I'll just give up my house temporarily until I can find something, keep my job, live out of my car for a little while, and I'll put some money together, and then I'll, you know, be able to do something. And then it turns into years, and the car goes away. And, you know. Yeah. And the city makes a law against living in your car. Yeah. Or sleeping in your car even, right? Yeah. I th I've I've said since they passed that ridiculous law that will never hold up uh, constitutionally, I don't think that we should have a sleep-in. Get a bunch of us together and we park right in front of City Hall and spend the night there. And uh, back to renting again, um, I think we're all in roughly the same age area. When I was young, we could I could bounce around from place to place for for quite a long time was what I did, but now it's just a complete different time, and it just isn't that easy anymore. And uh, back to also about people becoming homeless, a lot of nuances how how they how they become. My granddaughter and her husband, who live in Yuba City, uh, signed a year lease uh, a year ago. Then they they re-signed it again here just a couple of months ago. And all of a sudden, the lady said, "No, I'm selling. You got to leave." Now they could, I guess, fight it, but but they didn't, and they were lucky enough to actually buy their first home down there. But it was iffy. But and that's just one little uh, example of how people can get the rug pulled out from underneath them. 
because they're young. Now, they're, uh, my son and daughter-in-law are there. They could have moved in, but maybe they, what if they weren't? Where would they have gone? I don't know. Um, and the other one is we talked about lot rent for mobile homes. Lee, maybe you know this. I have a friend in a park. I won't mention the, the park either, <laughs> but um, very low income, struggles to get along. All of a sudden this year, the lot rent jumped from, I think, 550 It jumped up $90. Now, wow. I don't know. That didn't sound like a fair raise, but what, what are you mm -hmm. going to do? No. Sometimes, and I can't speak to this particular law as far as how much you're allowed to, you know, what the exceptions are. But in some circumstances, because it was sold to somebody else, the park has a chance to reset the, not the park, whatever the entity is, because I really don't know about this particular law, but there are limits as to how much you can raise things in a park for sure. Um, but there probably are some kind of exceptions, like maybe when it, the park changes hands or something like that. So we are uh, have less than five minutes left. Is that correct? Yeah. So, Less than three now. <laughs> um, I'd like to say something again that Shirley said at the beginning. We are the two uh, affordable housing residents. So if you are living on the edge and you, there's any chance you might be evicted in the future, you know, you need to plan ahead and get yourself on a waiting list because there's a lot of affordable housing in other cities and a little bit here. So if you, if you think that you are in danger of losing your home, you need to get yourself on a waiting list for affordable housing. And we can also pray that our government, if we, if we vote right and elect the right people, will look at statistics and say, we don't have enough housing for the workforce. We've got to build some, and we've got to take this in hand like they've done in Phoenix and Talent, and we've got to build, build build housing. And we have to ha stop having politicians in Congress encouraging people to have beautiful babies. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, then there's nice that. Subject. That's a whole other show. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and another show we really, well, we, we didn't get around to talking about is all the possible cooperative type alternative housing situations. I would love to talk more about that. One of the things I want to like to do in this little village, this unit that I was just talking about earlier is put several in a row there. And that's, you know, it's not quite the same as putting together an alternative situation, but it would be like that in some ways. And I'm, I'm looking, trying to figure out how we can do some creative things here. And that's would it be okay idea. if I gave yeah. my number if somebody would like to talk to me about these kinds of issues? Sure. It's 541 251 1885. 541 251 1885. Yep. And I want people to know that they there are five places here that you should sign up, sign up, get on the waiting list. Some of the young families who live in subsidized housing have gotten their act together, gotten better jobs, whatever it is, and they've moved out. And, and so that doesn't happen, you know, on a daily basis. But there is opportunity, and, and those two or three years go by faster than you'd think. So... And 30 seconds go by faster than you think, and that's what we're <laughs> down to. <laughs> uh, so we're, we're wrapping this up right now. I, I want to tell everybody that you've been listening to the Curry Cafe on KCIW LP in beautiful Brookings, Oregon, and we're about ready to get out of here now. Or maybe we'll bring this up at another time and finish what we've been talking about. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.